Hello, this is Thomas Keegan with LibertarianProgressive.com. And today we have an interview with Sean Hogg, uh, Libertarian for U.S. Senate for North Carolina 2016. And LibertarianProgressive.com is where you'll find interviews with, um, right now, about 30 candidates who are on the ballot. And the only alternate choice, what I mean by that, is besides a Republican and a Democrat, uh, incumbent status quo candidates. And so you'll see 30-plus interviews there uh, this year, and we're going to hope to have about 50. So check them out and share them. And, Sean, good to talk with you today, and welcome to LibertarianProgressive.com and BlogTalkRadio.com forward slash election channel. Well, thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. Well, we appreciate you being on the ballot, so you are giving people another option this year um, besides uh, – what what is standard i guess you could say and also um that we, so we can interview you today so sean have you ever run for office before why are you running this year as a libertarian for you know this the senate for north carolina sir well i have run, uh for office several times before this is the third time that i've been the libertarian candidate for us senate here in north carolina I ran in 2002 and then again last time in 2014. And I had retired. I thought I was done with all of this when I retired from politics in 2010. But uh, it, when 2014 rolled around, I saw that the Libertarian Party needed a candidate for U.S. Senate. And I knew that the Democrats and Republicans just weren't going to talk about uh, trying to end our state of perpetual war or do anything about our unsustainable debt. I mean, we really need to stop all war and stop spending more money than we have. These are common sense issues that are shared by, I believe, the majority of Americans. And I just felt moved to uh, get back into it again and to uh, be able to present that message to people so they knew that they'd have an alternative besides the failed policies of the Democrats and Republicans. So that sounds like your two big issues there, and um, well, let's we'll get into the issues. And actually, you can see a lot of your issues and stances at seanhogg dot com. S e a n h a u g h dot com. And um, mm-hmm. and Sean, actually, let me ask you: Have you been in the? Have has there any? Has there been any debates at this point? Are there any debates coming up so far, sir? Uh, To my knowledge, um, there may be one between my two opponents. I've been frozen out of that one. I was able to debate uh, last time with uh, my Democratic and Republican opponents, and I thought I did very well uh, in that. Um, And it's – but Richard Burr is the incumbent that we're running against, and I'm thinking that uh, he is really reluctant to debate you know all of the the debating depends on the willingness of candidates to debate so uh, in this case this is an organization the North Carolina Association of Broadcasters that had originally invited me in their initial planning and then come to find out there's there after months and months of wrangling that uh, they're, they're going to be hosting a debate with uh, my two opponents only, and th- there's been no, I've seen no interest in it. It seems like people just really aren't terribly excited about watching a debate between two candidates when I'm not included. Yeah, it seems like there's maybe something missing, like uh, watching a movie, but um, knowing ahead of time that it's going to be cut off at the last 15 minutes before it ends. And um, so i uh, <laughs> You're just on the ballot, right, as the other two candidates, I assume, right? You're not a write-in candidate. Correct. You're on it's the ballot. Just, it's right? just that I am, I am on the ballot. The Libertarian Party is on the ballot here in North Carolina, and we are the only third party currently who has been able to uh, leap the insane barriers to ballot access that uh, the state of North Carolina puts up in front of third party and independent candidates. So, in a sense, the debate is currently going on, the debate in public opinion, at least. Um, you know, w- in a sense, um, you're actually engaging in the debate. I assume you're more than willing, I would assume, to be in the debates. And if there were multiple debates, you would be in multiple debates as well, right? 
Oh, absolutely. The funny thing about this, and, and this really helps me. I'm very easy to work with. And this has really helped me develop a good relationship with uh, the media in general and with organizations that put together debates. Um, but the, uh, yeah, I mean, my, the, the other candidates have these pages long lists of requirements and conditions. And my only requirements are for them to tell me uh, where I need to be and at what time. And you know what? Um, if you, let's say you were elected, let's say there was a, a wave of discontent and, um, and, and Sean Hogg mm-hmm. was elected as a U.S. Senator for the state of North Carolina this year, November 8, 2016, 40 days away. And let's say in six years, um, you're the incumbent. And if you decided to run again, um, and let's say there's a challenger coming up who wanted to challenge you, would you choose not to debate them? Or can you promise us that you would be open to debating any uh, future oh. potential challengers? I mean, you wouldn't well, do the no, same Well, no, just thing. the opposite. In 2014, one of the debates that I participated in was with the write-in candidates. There were three. uh, Here in North Carolina, you have to jump through another hoop uh, to be declared an official write-in candidate just so that your votes for you will be reported. And last time, there were three write-in candidates. And there was a debate sponsored uh, by an uh, organization called Free the Vote North Carolina that invited all of us. And the Democrat and Republican didn't show up, but I did. You know, I'm, I will debate anybody who is a candidate for office, even if their name isn't printed on the ballot, uh, uh-huh. at least in, in this situation. So absolutely, uh, I would want, I think the voters really deserve to have frequent and debates. Whose um, interest is it for um, the uh, candidates who are printed on the ballot with taxpayer dollars um, to not want to be in the debate? Is it, uh, you, you know, the interest of the voters for them um, or is it their own interests that they're serving? Oh, not having certainly everyone their own on the interests. Yeah. Yeah. And, certainly their uh, own interests. I mean, I understand the strategy of, um, an incumbent who thinks that if he just keeps his head low, like Richard Burr does, then maybe I can get through this without anybody noticing. You know, they're Let relying on the power of incumbency only. Yeah. So the fundamental question is, um, is it whether you win or lose or how you play the game, Sean? Well, that I think that um, we need a lot of honorable behavior uh, to return on it. It's j- besides, the issues. I also run, there are other aspects to the job. Uh, the, uh, the United States Senator is sent to Congress to administrate the federal government on behalf of the people. So you have to be you know, knowledgeable about how to run things. And also uh, constituent services is a very big part of the job that isn't discussed at all. And in all of these areas, you know, as well as on the issues, uh, you know, my job is to represent the people. So I have to be accessible to the people. I have to always be seeking out uh, the opportunity to listen to people uh, and let them tell me what is really important to them and, you know, what, how do they want me to represent them in Congress. Uh, and now it's just a cesspool of special interests. You know, well, yeah, where... so people say a congressperson spends about half their time um, fundraising. Oh, I know. And, it's, and, and giving, granting access to those people who can give them significant amounts of money. However, I think that that is really changing. I think that the uh, Internet has brought a tremendous level of power to the average voter, Um, you know, that that people are able to express their opinions and have influence and be heard uh, in ways now that don't involve writing a big check to a politician. So, So you know, and there are candidates, go ahead. No, I was just case this is an issue, actually, and you, I think you kind of allude to it on your website here. So you have um, a few pages of issues, and one is on public service, 
And so maybe this has something can tie into that, um, you, you know, the issue of public service and especially um, it's not, it's kind of like freedom of speech. It's, you shouldn't be so much judged on how you treat people that you totally agree with, but more so um, you can really see the character of someone, um, how you interact with them and approach them with someone you totally disagree with. So, so how yeah. are you going to build consensus in North Carolina? I mean, you're a libertarian. Um, mm-hmm. you know, maybe you, there is an opportunity for consensus. How are you reaching out to people that uh, might not share all your views and how would you approach that? Um, what does public service mean to you being the, uh, uh, you know, a representative, a Senator from North for the whole state of North Carolina? Well, one of the nice things about my message stop all war and stop spending more money than we have is that I can go to any group of people all across the political spectrum and say the exact same thing. You know, give this, I can give the same speech no matter to whom I'm speaking. And I'm going to be able to get a really positive response because uh, what we have right now is this uh, partisan, you know, people are placing party ahead of the country. Uh, If they're Democrats or Republicans, uh, you particularly see these uh, a bunch of Republicans, uh, you know, like Ted Cruz being the most high profile example, saying, "Yes, I'm I'm willing to endorse Donald Trump for president now, but uh, no, I am not going to answer the question about whether or not I think he's even fit to serve." Um, So, you know, I and I think that people voters are smarter and they're given credit for and they see through all of this stuff and they want people who are going to be honest with them and who are going to behave honorably uh, you know to you know be consistent uh, you see a lot of times too uh, you're seeing a lot of tweets right now I know uh, about people uh, comparing candidates who are people who are politicians who are endorsing their candidate for president now and the horrible, horrible things they said about them when they were running against them. You see, I don't have that problem. You don't, you don't, you can't dig into my tweets and find somebody that I'm willing to stand in public with today, you know, me castigating them before. Uh, I think it's really important to recognize that if I'm elected, I am there to represent all of the people of North Carolina and not just those who support me or voted for me. Uh, And in fact, in a sense, I'm more beholden to the people who opposed me because I have to go the extra mile to assure them that I am representing them just like I'm representing all the other citizens of North Carolina. Hey, well, very good, Sean. Let's um, jump into some of the uh, other issues here. Um, now, war, you have a couple of uh, ways that you uh, address the issue. One of them is the culture of war. So if you could um, yeah. express your position on war as, um, as you stated here, as a culture of war. Exactly. I mean, I see it all as a unified issue. Everything from uh, a president who claims the power to kill anybody he wants to anywhere in the world just on his say-so, all the way down to neighbors arguing over parking spaces. We have created this culture where violence and killing is seen as a first resort, as a solution to uh, solving our social and political problems. The Libertarian Party is founded on the principle that we do not initiate force against people or commit violence against people in order to try to get our way politically or socially, uh, that we have to find peaceful voluntary means to uh, work out our relationships with other people. Uh, so I, I just see it as you know, a whole continuum from our warfare uh, directly around the world to our proxy wars that other countries are fighting with our weapons and support and our arms sales to everyone and everyone. Uh, These to me are connected to our militarization of police at home and our militarization of the border. Uh, And uh, and it gets down to culture war when people see 
their own government, their own elected leaders uh, employing killing as government policy, well, they're a lot more likely to think it's okay to employ killing as personal policy. So the, the, I really feel like the federal government can take a really strong role to set a positive example, to become peaceful. And once we have uh, government policy and instead have peace as government policy, uh, I think that the results will just flow all the way through our culture. And that yeah, I see fewer what you're and fewer saying. people will be reputable with that. I yeah. totally see what you're saying from the micro to the macro from, you know, if you have a mustard seed, it's um, going to grow into a mustard tree, you know. And uh, so what about um, you have here pollution is a crime. Uh, could you address yeah. what, what does that mean, sir? And, it, you know, I'm not saying it's not a crime, but if you could explain that. Well, right now our approach to pollution uh, and or regulating is is uh, just incredible, and it's all designed to preserve the profits and market shares of those corporate special interests that contribute to politicians. When the simple truth of the matter is, is that uh, an act of pollution is aggression against other people. You're committing a violent act against other people. And you have to take personal responsibility for that. Uh, right now, we have a big issue here in North Carolina from over two years ago where Duke Energy uh, had a disaster at one of their coal ash um, disposal sites and mucked up the entire Dan River for 70 miles. And people are still suffering from in if in operations and board corporations are for those acts of pollution and had to compensate their victims fully instead of getting off with some small with some small and that's just the cost of doing business for them well i think you, you'd see their decisions will change and they will be a lot less likely to uh, engage in activities that results in something like this coal ash spill here in north carolina or at now that there's a big movie coming out about it, you know, the, the oil spill in the Gulf, um, I would much rather see these corporations have to go to the insurance companies and say, uh, we can promise that there's no risk here to insure us for these activities that we're, we're doing, uh, rather than going to the government and saying, hey, can you protect us from liability and let us off the hook when we have a boo boo. <laughs> That's right. And an insurance company wouldn't even insure them if the risk was too big, you know. So I agree with um the libertarian stance that there should be a lot less regulation and it's tying people down. But at the same time if someone's potentially going to do something where the damage has a you know, likelihood that it's going to do more damage than they could ever pay back in restitution, then, you know, maybe that's something that might need to be prevented or have safeguards or something like that. Um, and well, I, I'm sure part that's of it to me. Kind of, yeah, sure. Uh, part of me is that I'm not an expert on anything. Part, you know, we have this image of, and senators themselves, <laughs> generally Richard Byrd definitely has this image of himself as an expert on everything. I am not an expert on this, um, but I've studied up enough on it that you can look at, say, uh, nuclear power. And, uh, you know, uh, where my gut would say, oh, no, insurance companies would never cover them. But that industry now has been so safe for so long here in the United States that it is conceivable to me that insurance companies would accept uh, nuclear power plants as clients and agree to cover uh, uh, that even, even, even the, the worst case scenario is very, very bad. Um, it, it really, if you take this, the approach, uh, then people are going to learn how to manage their risks. Uh, right now, they don't have any incentive to do that. 
Sure, and an insurance company might cover a nuclear power plant under certain conditions as well, like if you build on one site versus another site. So I don't know those things either, but they would at least take that into consideration. And then we would have to also make sure that we don't bail out the insurance companies so that they're really on their own, you know, um, so that they can make uh, a real decision, you know. Um, and, uh, well, what about um, – uh, you have here a better way to engage Islamic extremists. Um, yeah, if you could, uh, what would that better way? We definitely like to hear that. Okay, I think Sean's calling us. Sean, good to have you back here. I think uh, the first the call got this. There's some. Uh, yes, and I uh, apparently yeah. I, I I sadly dropped the call. But I think I, I was able to follow everything that you said. Uh, I have a new video for this campaign, too, uh, about uh, how to deal with ISIS. And was, it's obvious that uh, our approach uh, for the last 15 years of perpetual war has failed utterly. It's only served to uh, increase enemies uh, like ISIS and Al-Qaeda and um, you know, they are armed with weapons that we have either left behind in Iraq or have been giving to other, um, you know, begin giving to other countries in, in the region. I have a new video that's going to be coming out soon on our alliance with Saudi Arabia where I touch on this too. It seems like a lot of the weapons that we're sending to Saudi end up in the hands of ISIS and Al-Qaeda and gee, I, I wonder why. So we need to cut out. We're not going to give get peace by giving everybody a gun. We need to uh, cut off that flow of arms in the region, and we need to stop being belligerent. Uh, Washington and Jefferson gave us the the best advice on this topic, and America has done very well when it's followed it, which is free trade with all and entangling alliances with none, which is what I was trying to get to in the first video a better way to engage Islamic extremists because through free trade, then people in all these countries see the benefits of freedom and see the benefits of American prosperity. And they want more of that. And they put pressure on their own governments at home to, you know, allow them those opportunities. That sounds great. And, you know, leading by example, um, you know, free trade with all, entangling alliances with none, and maybe other countries will see how prosperous we are and try to emulate. I want to follow up on that because you said the word perpetual war, and, you know, I haven't really thought about that as much, but there are people I have talked to, and not many, I think this is more rare, but that say, you know what, we should have the war to end all wars. I think Woodrow Wilson said that one. We should go across the entire world bring democracy to everyone that way you know future generations can all grow up in peace so we might as well just get it over with and just go to war with china russia you know iran just get it all over with and let's do it i mean is that well you def, definitely I'm, wouldn't be for that i'm sure that there are people in china and russia who think the same thing that we just need to take over the world and impose our will on everybody else and you know it's just not working you 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 go bomb people and then you wonder why they hate us you know that that's just the lunacy of american foreign policy and and speaking about the war to end all wars yeah that worked out really well for us the first two times didn't it you know uh, war only begets more war uh, and this is why, uh, you know, more and more people across the country are gravitating to that basic libertarian principle. Uh, another way that I put it is don't hit people and don't take their stuff. That's really it. It's just the simple playground rules. And if we can get our government to abide by those two simple rules, uh, then we would have just far more effective policy both foreign policy and domestic and sean i want to ask you on this you had a title here that i'm curious to hear about on one of your issues good at math um so you know 
you you might I, well I don't know if you're a mathematician or not, but how how good are you at math, Sean? <laughs> I'm reasonably good. You know, I I retain a command of uh, everything I learned up through high school. You know, all the calculus and stuff and arithmetic. But my point in the good at math, uh, that was that was actually very much targeted towards my two opponents at the time. Uh, because one the Republican opponent who ended up getting elected was the Speaker of the State House. And at that time, we were getting all sorts of bad news about how about shortfalls in the state budget because of their gross miscalculations. Uh, but uh, it, you know, now, but it still stands that Democrats and Republicans both can't balance a budget. Uh, keep voting to raise the debt ceiling. And, you know, it really doesn't matter how big the numbers get. It's still all basically addition and subtraction. And I'm, as a libertarian, I get really, really excited about subtraction. You know, I think that we need, we, we need to, we need to stop the sense of sustainable debt. We need to live within our means, not spend any more money than we have. Well, so, where should we be in ten a, years from now? What, like, what would be like realistic and ideal? Um, you know, right now it's 2016, 40 days away from election day. What, what, where do you think we should be in 2026 budget wise, ideally? Oh gosh, um, I think that we should. Uh, we're about you know, twenty I haven't trillion really dollars in out. debt, right? Yeah. Okay, I, I'm just going off the cuff. Here, sure. uh, because I haven't really done a serious mathematical analysis to answer your question. Uh, but I, one of the issues that I keep bringing up is that currently government takes up all government in the country takes up about thirty eight percent of the entire gross domestic product. I mean that's all our productivity. Uh, you know, over two thirds of it going to pay for government. Of that or if you just look at the federal government, rather, federal government consumes about 22.5% of the GDP. And I really, so I really focus on that number and really want to bring that down as much as possible because the more wealth that we can keep in people's pockets, uh, the better off the average person will be. And I have faith that the average person can spend their money far more conscientiously and efficiently than the government can. Uh, so I, I really want to see uh, you know, drastic cuts in the military because right now, like I said, we've got arms sales going on. We subsidize so many different wars and foreign interventions, and that's really the big ticket item that I want to try to get out of government. I also uh, you know, think that we need to do something to shore up the debts that we have for people over entitlement programs, such as Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, uh, because, like it or not, we're committed to those people now. You know, libertarians are very big on contracts. And uh, in the current system, we have an agreement to take care of certain people. So one idea that I have, which I borrowed from our presidential candidate, Harry Brown, from 1996 and 2000, is that the federal government owns a tremendous number of assets that could be easily sold off, such as large tracts of land in the western half of the United States. Um, and I'm not talking about selling off the national parks or anything like that, uh, but you know we could sell off a lot of that property or a lot of that surplus and uh, use that money to buy private annuities for people who are currently dependent on Social Security. And that that would actually put them in a better position. They would get a better return on that than they currently get on Social Security. Uh, I don't really see – I'm 55, so 10 years from now I'll be 65. I do not expect Social Security to be there for me when that happens. Uh, And when I get there, I really think the system is is bound to collapse. And that – I mean, so avoiding systems failures – uh, is also just very important because you have to 
because if if systems like that do fail, it will reverberate through the economy in incredibly negative ways, and a lot of people would suffer. Uh, so, uh, you know, really, I just focus on getting government uh, as small as possible, vastly reduce the size and scope of government, so that the productivity of the people can can have more liberty and, and take over. I really believe that freedom leads to prosperity. Uh, and that leads to a lack of scarcity, and that uh, that is something you know. That economic freedom is something that really frees people to be incredibly creative and improve the world. Yeah, and uh, I mean, you are at least looking at um, the big uh, ticket items there. Um, and uh, now you had one issue here. I did. I was curious about. You said term limits for reporters. Uh, can you explain that <laughs> a little bit? I I just reposted that on my social media a couple of days ago. Uh, yeah, we have a problem in this country uh, with uh, I feel like the division, the real division in this country, rather, is between the uh, what I call the political class and regular working people. And the political class is not just politicians. Now, I found uh, I used to be against term limits on principle. Uh, when I started, but after getting into this and working with people in Washington and Raleigh, I discovered, yeah, it really is about six years before uh, the average legislator completely loses track of the reality that goes on outside that little dome of theirs. And you see this now with people who follow cable TV news in particular. We've set up so many different little echo chambers uh, that the reality for a lot of people, a lot of reporters, a lot of uh, other people who make their living in the political class, and even just a lot of uh, average people, TV viewers, uh, that how to put it that that they have, they have listened to this perspective for so long and bought into it for so long that that's the reality for them instead of the everyday reality that everybody else lives in. So, you know, I encourage people to turn off cable TV news and to go seek all different kinds of sources of information. And, um, you know, and I certainly encourage reporters. You see a lot of reporters out there who have been in this business for so long that they too only understand the reality of what happens inside those little domes. That's, I mean, that's that is the saying. I mean, people are in a bubble, and, and Washington is out of touch. And so, I mean, I guess I was gonna at some point ask you, you know, how are you gonna stay in touch? But I guess term limits might be the way. Um, you know, one thing that you might propose if you do get to, um, you, you know, the Congress as a senator is um, for the budget. By the way, it was a penny plan. It's um, a budget plan that just. Um, tries to take one cent be cut from every dollar of federal spending and it's expected to save about 7.5 trillion over 10 years. But what about, um, here's uh, two other issues here you have listed here. Um, stop the war on drugs and delete the NSA. Yeah. Can you touch on those two issues, sir? Oh, sure. Well, I mean, the war on drugs, again, it's just such an obvious failure and the majority of American people, are tired of it. And it has so many negative consequences. I mean, we have the largest prison population in the world, far and away. Um, we have ruined so many people's lives, not just by sending them to prison, but then they come out with a, a criminal record and they have to try to find a job and pick up the pieces. You know, uh, with the war on drugs is, to me, at the root of our, our imbalances in immigration. Right now, because we've been fighting this war on drugs in South America and in Mexico, all, all the countries of Central America. And what we've done is help create these violent drug cartels that have made uh, life a living hell for a lot of people to, in the countries to the south of us. So they do the rational thing and think, oh, well, let me move somewhere where I'm less likely to get shot and more likely to be able to make a living for myself and my family. And that's why you see this flood of people coming here. I think that if we could 
uh, and the war on drugs, uh, that would be a major step towards putting uh, South American, Central American countries on the path back to peace and prosperity. And then people would be more likely to stay home to try to make something for themselves and their families and feel like they have to flee to somewhere else like the United States. Um, And then you look at it from the opposite angle. You look at a country like Portugal that several years ago uh, took the exact opposite approach. got rid of all their drug laws, completely legalized drugs, and instead of demonizing drug users, they treated addiction as a public health issue. And the benefits of that for Portuguese society have just been incredible. And they're saving a lot of money. They're spending a whole lot less money on treating drug addicts than they are on putting them in prison. So there are all kinds of reasons why the war on drugs needs to end. The uh, NSA uh, should be abolished completely and their files on us deleted. Uh, The whole notion that uh, government uh, should be spying on its own people is completely anathema to the Constitution, the American way. Now, my opponent, Richard Burr, is a huge fan of um, the NSA and, and, and spying on the American people. He's for, you know, browser searches, not needing a warrant to be able to search somebody's Internet history. That's something that's active in Congress right now. He sponsored a bill with Dianne Feinstein, a Cal- Democrat from California, to, who also is absolutely no friend of the American people or privacy, uh, to demand that there are back doors in your phone or other devices so the FBI can get in and rummage around and see what you're doing with your phone. And they don't realize that is, this is another area where their complete lack of expertise in business and industry uh, just leads to really absurd results. Yeah, because if you ha- if you have a back door that the FBI can get into, hackers are going to find that and exploit it. And and so our the government's desire to collect all this information about us and to uh, be able to see anything that we're doing without a warrant or without probable cause. Um. I mean, it's it's not just violating people's privacy. It could really like bring a crashing halt to the entire economy. <laughs> so yeah, it's kind of funny. You know, the, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, I, no, you go ahead. I, I, I I'm well, I was going to say it's just kind of funny how when there's a win, it's a win-win, and when there's a lose, it's a lose-lose. Like, um, like with the drug war, it's a, it's a win for families. Um, but it's also a win for the budget. Um, as far as the NSA, it's it's a lose for s- civil liberties, but it's also a lose. Actually, it makes us actually less secure, more vulnerable to hackers, like you're saying. Oh. And um, so it's. I've always been. I'm sorry. Didn't mean to cut you off there. No, there's just a little bit no, of a I'm, delay, and I was just going to say we're talking with uh, Sean Hogg again, um, Senate candidate for uh, U.S. Congress this year um, for North Carolina, and you can visit his website at Sean, S-E-A-N, Hogg, H-A-U-G-H dot com. And, yes, please go ahead, sir. Oh, okay. Well, now I'm sort of – oh, we were talking – oh, yes. I'm a very huge fan of the notion that the moral – and the practical are one in the same. I mean, when when we have justice, it's a win for everybody. Um, so, and that's really what I'm looking for. You, do, you can break down so many of these issues uh, on this notion that respecting the rights of the people leads to positive. Uh, really tangible consequences, uh, you know, a lot of economic consequences. You know, when I talk about reducing the size and scope of government so you can keep all the money that you earn, well, you know, a whole lot of those people who are going, when if they are able to start to get ahead, uh, well, uh, many people are just going to like st- quit their third or fourth job and spend more time with their families. You know, that by itself is inherently a good thing. But a lot of people would become entrepreneurs 
if we could get rid of the regulations that keep people from you know getting into business or trying to make something uh off of their own natural talents and experience well then you know you would have people starting new businesses and as those businesses grow they would hire more people from the community and when you have i'm just a huge believer in that small business is the engine that makes the economy go because the the more uh, uh, small business that you have that's successful the more likely they're going to keep their money within the community and have it you know circulating you know, have that wealth circulate in a way or circulating there rather instead of being shipped away to some corporate headquarters in Arkansas or something. And uh, they're going to provide jobs for people and they're going to have the opportunity to be creative instead of being stuck in, uh, you know, the current paradigm, people can create new paradigms for themselves. And that level of creativity is going to lead to human advancement far more than government could possibly provide. So, uh, you know, the, the economic benefits of of freedom uh, are, are are very important. This is not just some philosophical thing I'm talking about here. Yeah, and that's probably the reason why people do want to come here. I mean, if we didn't have the freedoms, um, you know, people like Albert Einstein, I'm, I'm sure they probably would have tried to flee somewhere else. Um, and and, and yeah. want, you know we we want entrepreneurs and and people like that and we want the environment that would want people to come here and now you mentioned Diane Feinstein she's maybe no friend of um the bill of, you know privacy you could say but also no friend to the Second Amendment either I don't think I, yeah. I don't know her rating with the NRA but I'm sure it's you know pretty down there um so what what is your stance? Well, it's not like the NRA is a friend of the Second Amendment either. <laughs> that might be true that. You know, that might be very well true. But you are, right? Uh, well, I am. And I say this as somebody who is not a gun owner. Uh, I, If you you listen to me for a while, you realize that I am all about nonviolence. And I do not want to have a gun in my life or have the, even the influence of guns in my life. But I'm smart enough to realize that... Uh, Banning stuff simply does not work. There is no magic wand I will be issued as a United States senator to make what I don't like just go away. You know, in order to have the fundamental change in our culture that I was talking about before to make it more peaceful and less violent, it requires you, – you can't impose that from the top. That has to be a grassroots thing. That has to come from – people's desire to listen to each other and respect each other and to make a personal commitment to, you know, try to get along with people and recognize that America is a very much pluralist society where we are here to allow everybody to have their freedom and to live life according to their values. And another thing I want to touch on about that too is that I, having been a libertarian for a long time, of course I know plenty of people who do enjoy exercising their uh, right to keep and bear arms. And I have listened to them and observed them, and I have learned that uh, owning a firearm is not necessarily an inherently violent thing, that the vast majority of gun owners are peaceful people who have their own peaceful reasons for, you know, what they're doing, uh, for for either collecting guns or, or making sure that they're trained uh, in the use of arms. Uh, so, you know, it's, to me, it's, I think a lot of the culture war that goes on over this issue is, a, is due to a lack of listening and due to a lack of understanding because I think if you – talk to uh, multiple gun owners like I have, you're going to find out that they really are peaceful people who want to get along with everybody else just like you and me. You know, so there's something to work with there. <laughs> no, I, and Sean, I really enjoyed this interview. We just have like one or two more questions. And, and so what I'm kind of getting out of it is that, um, you know, uh, you you want to be elected as a state's person um, to 
you know, set an example for a good culture. It's not the guns that might be the root of the issue, but it's actually the violence itself. And by, um, you know, maybe eliminating yes. the war on drugs, uh, you know, respecting, um, you know, the fundamental rights, uh, traditional rights of, of the Bill of Rights that have been in our society um, and, uh, you know, freeing up entrepreneurs. All of this is going to um, reduce violence a lot more than just passing some law about, uh, you, you know, and, and then uh, free trade with other countries, uh, no entangling alliances, um, et cetera. Right. And then that will also reflect into our budget as well. And um, so, yeah, I, I, I I'm starting to get a picture of uh, what, um, you know, a, a term, uh, a Sean Hogg term exactly. would be like. And um, so uh, I, there's a question I ask everyone here is um, who are some of your favorite people, uh, past or present, um, elected or not? <laughs> Fortunately, I've had a little bit of time to think about this one. <laughs> so, um I'm a big fan of Cincinnati, you know, and the whole notion of public service that his example uh, provided where, you know, he had been a general and then he'd retired and became a farmer. And then at the time that his, uh, that Rome needed him, uh, they called him up. And then as soon as he was done, went right back to farming. Uh, You know, the whole idea of, American government to begin with was that legislators were supposed to be part timers that were not well paid, you know. And the whole and if we still had that notion, then uh, you bet that people in Congress would want to hurry up and get their business done so they could get back home to their own businesses and get back to making money uh, legitimately. Um, but so anybody who has acted in that way and decided not to become a permanent member of the political class as a full-time job, uh, I would certainly admire them. In terms of current leadership around the world, I'm a big fan of the Dalai Lama. Uh, I just think he's an incredible man of peace and understanding, trying to bring people together. I'm a bit of a fan of Pope Francis for similar reasons. Uh, I have He's been getting into a lot of political issues, and I don't agree with him on a lot of that. But, and I also wish the Catholic Church, he would do more to clean up the child sex scandal in the Catholic Church. That really disturbs me. But having said that, the, the man he's obviously a man of peace, and his uh, Christ-like desire to uh, see, to, for people to recognize that we're all here on this planet together. Um, and and that pe- treating people with peace and with respect uh, is the right way to go. I mean, that informs everything that he does, and I really appreciate that. Uh, once I get into Congress, I am heartened by the fact that there are Democrats and Republicans alike who are taking important stands on issues that are near and dear to me, and they may be single issues uh, in all of these cases. Uh, For example, the 27 senators who just tried to block our latest billion-dollar arms transfer to Saudi Arabia. That was a bipartisan effort. And I feel like if I was in Congress as a libertarian and not beholden to that partisan game, I would have a tremendous opportunity to build coalitions on single issues and that way move all public policy in a more libertarian direction. Sounds good. And I was curious about um, just uh, here's the last question here. Um, uh, you had on your issues list vote no on the amendment. I assume that might be a local issue. What what was that about, sir? Oh, uh, we it was it was a, a statewide uh, issue um, and that just really isn't relevant. To campaign now. Okay. <laughs> so. Any upcoming um, events um, for you soon? Um, yes, I'm going to uh, – now, you may not know, uh, although it was news statewide, that I uh, I had a heart attack about a month ago. Uh, so that's unfortunately really 
cut into my my scheduling of events as I recover. The cruel irony of it is that my doctors tell me I should be back up to full speed just in time for election day. Um, but, yeah, let me pull up my calendar here real quick. On Saturday, October 8th, I'm going to be at an event in Asheville at the Lexington Avenue Brewery starting at 5 o'clock. And uh, that will feature a lot of other libertarian candidates from across the state. On Monday, October 10th, I'll be in Gastonia with the, um, you know, uh, again, another event that's going to feature our candidates for governor and lieutenant governor and state house. And I've got a few shifts at the North Carolina State Fair coming up. But, you know, you can check out my Facebook page, Hoff for Senate, on my Twitter account, at Emperor Sean, or on my website, SeanHaw.com, and you can be able to follow all of the different events that I'll be scheduling around the state. That sounds great. And I'm going to leave that amendment video as a cliffhanger. So if anyone is curious about what that was, visit SeanHaw.com, S-E-A-N-H-A-U-G-H.com. And, uh, Sean, it has been a pleasure if by any chance, um, you know, on a blue moon, your opponents decide to, you know, um, have the courage to have you in the debate and, and have the courage to, uh, you know, do what's in the best interest of the people they represent instead of just their political interests. Please send us a link of that debate and we'll put it, um, with your video, oh, which also it's, this is going to be rebroadcast again, people, if you want to re-listen to any of this, um, in whole or in part at libertarianprogressive.com in about 24 hours. And Sean, thank you so much for the interview. We appreciate you enlightening our audience and letting people know it's, uh, you, you know, there's other options out there and, um, and that you're running for the Senate candidate for North Carolina. You'll be on the ballot this November 8th, 2016. And so good luck and thank you again. We appreciate it very much. Well, thanks so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. <laughs>